Welcome viewers, it's another episode of our program Catholicism and You on Lumen Christi Television Network. I am Reverend Father Panaki Obede. On this episode, our first question is, is the book of Job a fact or a fiction? One thing I can say for sure is that the message of the book of Job is true. How the writer presented the message is another thing. He probably used a story about an actual person from the past, a courageous, heroic, and holy man who suffered greatly in patience and acceptance of God's will. But the dialogue, discussion, and other characters are added by the author. The story is not preserved in the Bible for its own sake. It's not history, as in a detailed account of something that happened in reality, but a way of explaining the word of God and the actions of God. The person who wrote the book is trying to understand and probe certain questions in existence. For instance, why do good people suffer? Why would bad things happen to good people? And he answers these questions through the mouth of Job. Those who are disturbed by the notion that the Bible contains fiction might be helped by remembering the story of the Good Samaritan. It is easier to recognize that it is not important whether a man actually went down from Jerusalem and fell among thieves and that a priest, a Levite, passed him by why it was only a Samaritan who came to his aid. It was not historical details that consigned Jesus. He was only using a story, whether true or false, or made up to make a point. The Old Testament writers, like in many of our cultures, also use such methodology to put across their message. Again, a viewer is asking, why does the book of Sirach refer to wisdom as she? The word wisdom is feminine in both the Hebrew and the Greek world. It is simply a common literary device. Even in our daily speech and conversation, we try to personify inanimate objects and abstract things. For instance, I've heard people speak of a sheep as she, and we talk about the mother church, and we proclaim the church as the bride of Christ, and often we refer to the earth as mother earth. Sirach, like all the wisdom books, simply personifies wisdom and endows it with human characteristics as we do when we speak of experience as had had a teacher or say that a religious has taken a lady poverty for a bride. It is a manner of speaking. The author or authors of Sirach were as much at home using this device effectively and beautifully as we are using it today. However, it is worth nothing that Father Lawrence remarked in the introduction to wisdom literature. Proverbs, several passages, treat wisdom as though it were an independent being, though close to God. For instance, if you read the book of Proverbs, chapter 1 from verse 20 to, 20 to 33, chapter 8 from verse 22 to 31. Even if you read the book of Sirach, chapter 24, from verse 1 to 31, wisdom itself, chapter 9, verse 9 to 11, we are going to have an idea of all these things. This is primarily a literary device to express how the transcendent God becomes present in a human and imminent way to communicate himself to our intelligence, understanding and faith. Without this development, 
Christian, Christianity's theology of Jesus as Son of God and Word made flesh could not have found such expression. If you are asking, did Samson commit suicide? According to the Encyclopedic Dictionary of the Bible, edicted by Louis Hartman, a redemptorist priest, he had this to say that Samson's death in the Temple of Dragon at Gaza, which he brought down on himself and the assembly at palace as the Philistines, in chapter 16, verse 23 to 30, was not an act of suicide, but rather a return to his mission to which he had been unfaithful to when he betrayed the secret of his strength to Delilah, but which he consciously responded to his call with a prayer to God on his lips, he now fulfilled even at the cost of his own death. From this point of view, Samson's death was like that of a martyr who dies in a defense of a virtue, as in a person who leaps into death rather than being sexually violated. According to a moralist, Herbert Nunn, he calls this an indirect suicide though, and says that while in itself it is forbidden, it may be permitted for a, an appropriately grave reason. According to Jones, he says, one kills himself indirectly if, without the intention of committing suicide, he knowingly and willingly does something which not only has an intended good effect, but from which death also follows. It is presupposed that the good effect Re results from the actions as immediately as does death. For instance, according to Nunn, he finds it permissible for a person to leap from a dangerous height to escape burning to death. Imagine you are in a building and the building is burning and out of that fear or because you want to leap into safety, you jump from a 30-story building and you try to escape the, the death of being burned. But you know in your mind, by jumping from 30th floor, it could also result to your own death. But you prefer to jump and take the trial because you never can tell. It can also lead to safety. You don't know where you can land. But you know by jumping, it can result to death. Or for someone in a wartime to blow up an enemy fortification or a ship, even though the person sees his or her own death in doing so. Another question is asked, why were lepers treated so harshly? You see, the term leprosy in the Bible seems to have to be used in reference to a number of skin infections, not Hazen's disease, which some people call today leprosy. Because these diseases were so infectious, the law in the book of Leviticus prescribed exclusion. That means the person should be quarantined. He should be removed from the society, from the community to prevent the spread. The affected persons rent a garment, bear the hair, and cries everywhere he goes unclean in order to warn others of the presence of the disease and the possibility of their contracting it. The quarantine was not meant to be a punishment, but as a health measure to create that precaution in existence. Though it seems very likely that people thought of diseases as a punishment for sin, the fear of catching the disease would lead people to act unkindly towards the diseased person. Why such actions are not to be excused, they were certainly not limited to the Jews at the time of Jesus. Nor was the desire to control and to stop the spread of infection. For instance, our newspapers are filled 
with examples of what fear can do to people in the presence of certain diseases in existence, for instance, HIV, AIDS. Some people out of fear refuse to go near people who have HIV, who are infected with AIDS. Those who do frequently take a lot of great precaution. Why? So that they don't want to be infected with such illnesses. Did the Jewish revolt against the Rome, Romans influence the writings of the Gospel? It's not easy to date exactly when each of the scripture in the Gospels were written. And certainly there were multiple reasons for each of the Gospels. But it does not appear that St. Paul was already dead by the time the first Gospel was put into the written form. The first of the Gospel, Mark, was written sometimes near 65 AD, when the Jewish zealots were revolting against the Roman rules. The Jewish Christians were at odds with their own as well as being caught up in the Roman persecution. The Roman reaction, however, to the zealots produced the destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersion of the surviving Jews around 70 AD. This event marked the definitive separation of the Jewish Christians from the rest of the Jewish communities. Families became split and Christians were put out of the synagogues. The author of Mark wanted to explain, among other purposes, the following Jesus that following Jesus demanded suffering and pain. Matthew, however, writing about 85 AD for a community made up a larger part from those with Jewish roots. He wanted to help them to make sense of the pain of persecution and the separation from their own. Luke, writing around 85 AD also for the Gentile audience, was less concerned with this event. John in 90 or around 100 AD was further from this event and had his own theological concerns. What are the symbols of the four evangelists? A viewer is asking. The key to the symbols of the evangelists we see in paintings and carves, especially on pulpits, on lecterns, is the differing ways in which the four Gospels began. For instance, the symbol for Matthew is the winged man, sometimes described as a divine man. This figure is used because Matthew teaches about the human nature of Jesus and begins his gospel by tracing the human ancestry of Jesus. A lion with wings represents Mark's, Mark and his gospel. Mark's gospel opens with John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness. The Baptist cry is like the roar, the rolling of a lion. An added reason for the lion is that Mark's gospel stresses the royal dignity and character or the character of Jesus. Athis have chosen to represent Luke and his gospel with winged ox. Luke begins with the scene in the temple where animal sacrifices are being offered. Luke explains the sacrificial character of Jesus' life and death. John's symbol is the eagle. In the prologue to his gospel, John's vision soars into the heavens and gazes into the mysteries surrounding the incarnation of Jesus with the piercing eyes of the eagle. Throughout the gospel, he reaches the loftiest heights of theology. 
The image of the symbols apparently comes from the first chapter of Ezekiel. Here, the prophet describes a vision in which the hand of the Lord came upon him. In the vision, there were figures, something like four living creatures. They had human forms and each had four faces, those of a man, a lion, an ox, and an, an eagle. Ezekiel chapter 1 from verse 3 to chapter 10. We shall quickly go for a short break and when we return we shall be treating other interesting topics. Don't go away. By the truth about God who created and redeemed us. By the truth about a human person made in the image and likeness of God, destined for a glorious fulfillment in the kingdom to come. Always be convincing witnesses to the truth. Stir into the flame the gift of God that has been bestowed upon you in baptism. Light your nation Light the world with the power of that flame. Amen. Welcome back. Just before the break, we were taking a look at the question, what are the four symbols of the evangelists? I will say the key to the symbols of the evangelists are seen in the paintings and carvings, especially depicted on the pulpits and lecterns, gotten from the idea in the scripture. Another viewer is asking, what does synoptic mean? Synoptic comes from the Greek word synopticos, which can be translated to mean seen together or seen with. Matthew, Mark, Luke are called the synoptic gospel because large sections of these writings when put side by side or seen together reveals something remarkable and somewhat of similarities. Similar patterns in narrating the event emerge and sections into two or three of them are almost identical word for word. This is true because the writers or editors probably gathered materials from some of these sources. Most likely, this written account of particular events, a narrative of the Passion, for example, or collections of Jesus' saying in circulation before a writer or editor collected as many as he could to include in his own telling of the good news. See, before the gospel took their present and final form, the evangelists or the editors may have borrowed from each other. John's gospel is distinguished from the synoptic because it is so different from all of them. The writer of John may not have known or been aware of the other accounts. He used different, a different source and has his own distinct approach and style. His writing is highly theological. He follows his own order and chronology in telling the story of what Jesus said and did. While others came from below, from the human perspective, 
John will come from the divine perspective. Why do the gospel accounts differ on some details such as the thieves crucified with Jesus? If you ask 10 witnesses about an automobile accident, a car accident, what happened? What will you get? 10 different accounts of the same incident. All will describe the, the same event Many of the details will be the same, but some will include details that the other omits or tell the story from a perspective different from that of the other. With that in mind, it helps us to understand why the gospel accounts are not always the same. They are different because they are the works of four different writers or editors each with his own viewpoint of what Jesus thought and said and did. Each is writing for a particular church or group of readers. Each has his own theology. Each wants to explain the meaning of Jesus and what he did as he sees it. And so the incidents and facts he selects are chosen with these things in mind, to support the point he wants to make, he can add or he can paint, he can cook up the story, but the idea, the general idea will still remain the same. Further, you must remember that each evangelist in working from the oral account and reading the scripture or the written collections of Jesus' saying that have come into his possession Often, the same materials are known to several and all the evangelists too. Sometimes, each has his own particular source and tradition from which to work. Each evangelist will give his own account using facts about Jesus as he receives them. Why do Matthew and Mark differ from Luke in their account of the thief who were put to death with Jesus. You see, probably because they are working from different accounts. Some recall the turns, the insults. Others recall more vividly the mercy that Jesus showed on the cross and often repeated how Jesus prayed for his enemy and promised paradise and forgiveness to one of the thieves who asked for mercy. Obviously, each evangelist is telling the story of Jesus' passion and death, trying to make clear its significance and the meaning as he saw it. Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Mark for instance, wanted to show the Old Testament prophecies and Psalms were fulfilled and stressed how the scribes, the Pharisees, and the robbers were as the passerby taunted and ridiculed Jesus. Luke wanted to stress the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus and the coming of God's kingdom among us. The dialogue between the good thieves and Jesus is very important to this. Why the story, the idea, the message of the story remains consistent the, the, the way they choose to present the story can differ because it's different people telling the same story. What does the phrase, asleep in Jesus, mean? Both the expression, asleep in Jesus, and falling asleep are found in the letters of Paul. Whether you wish to call sleeping or asleep in Christ a metaphor or euphemism, using good words to quote certain things, it means death. According to Oxford Annotated Bible, the Revised Standard Version translation, it says 
in uh, its footnote to First Thessalonians chapter four verse fourteen. Those who are asleep was a common metaphor for the dead. The footnote refers to the Gospel of John, chapter eleven verse eleven to sixteen, where Jesus's dialogue with the apostles about the death of Lazarus. In verse 11, Jesus tells his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. When the apostles failed to understand him, verse 14 tells us that Jesus now told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. We ourselves use various euphemisms. We use good things to paint some certain negative things. To talk about the death or death itself. When somebody dies, for instance, we say, he has kicked the bucket. We speak about those who rest in Christ in peace. As we say, the Lord came and took her asleep in Christ. Would also help to convey the idea that it is not the end of everything. When Christians die, death is not an end. To so use the word sleep means therefore that the person who has died wakes up on an other side refreshed. The Christian who dies has the resurrection and life afterwards to anticipate. With this, my dear friends, we draw the curtain on today's episode and I believe you had a wonderful time staying with us. If there is any question you want to ask, anything you need clarification you want to have more understanding about certain issue kindly send your comments or your suggestions to the numbers on the screen or you can use our email info at lumenchristietelevision.com until next time same time again next week i am reverend father panaki obede god bless you